Blessings in Jesus, wonderful to be with you here in Devore as always. We've got a, quite a fairly long teaching today, but we have to get it into the time allotted because we have the Lord's Supper today also. So turn with me please, first of all, to 2 Kings chapter 4. May the Lord bless this reading and exposition of his word in Jesus' name. We're looking at the seven sneezes, the seven sneezes. Yes. Verse 8. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by continually. Please, let us make a little walled upper chamber and let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand, which is obviously figurative of the word of God. We know from Psalm 119, verse 105 and Revelation chapter 1 and so forth. And it came about when he comes to us, he can turn in there. One day he came there and turned into the upper chamber and rested. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, say now to her, behold, you have been careful with us, with all of this care. What can I do for you? What would be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the army? And she answered, I live among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Truly she has no son, and her husband is old. Now you have to understand that the background is something called Yerusha, Yerusha, the inheritance. The land had to stay in the same family from the apportionment of Joshua. So it was important to have a son. Additionally, there was no social security. Your pension was your children. That is the primary Hebrew meaning of honor thy father and mother. You get the Greek word honorarium from the Septuagint. As you were financially, yeah, as your parents were financially responsible for you in pediatric years, should the need arise, you're responsible for your parents in geriatric years. Not having a son was a big deal. It was a big problem. Um, it was almost seen as a kind of a curse or a judgment for sin in certain contexts. But let's look. And he said, call her. And when she had called her, she stood in the doorway and said, at this time next year, you shall embrace the son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. And the woman conceived and bore a son at that season and the next year as Elisha had told her. Let's begin with Elisha. Elisha, Elisha, God is there. Elijah, Eliyahu, God is, my God is Yahweh. My God is there, my God is Yahweh, and John the Baptist, Yohanan Hamatbil, all have the same spirit. They all had the same spirit. When you see something about Elisha, we have to look at how it contrasts to John the Baptist and to Elijah. Now remember, Elijah also did a miracle with a woman's son, okay, raising from the dead. Additionally, um, we see a supernatural conception. The supernatural conceptions, they were usually, they were usually postmenopausal or, or geriatric pregnancies in the Old Testament. They foreshadowed the fact that the Messiah would have to be conceived supernaturally. Okay? The Messiah would be conceived supernaturally. Mary, of course, was not an old lady. She was probably a teenager, but Jesus was conceived supernaturally. Hence, going back to Sarah, the supernatural pregnancies were, were foreshadowing the fact that the Messiah would be conceived supernaturally. Okay? Now, let's continue looking at this a bit further. Okay? <clears throat> she is in the character of Sarah, isn't she? Sarah laughed, didn't believe it, didn't believe it was going to happen. Well, it was the same thing. She just couldn't believe it was too incredible that it was going to happen, but it did. When the child was grown, in verse 18, the day came when he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. 
And he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. We don't know what this could have been, a cerebral hemorrhage, we don't know. But when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her lap until noon and then died. Now again, you have the connection of Jesus going to the cross at noon and his mother witnessing it. All of these things foreshadow the death of Christ. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door after him and went out. And she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and return. And he said, why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath, Shabbat. And she said, it will be well. Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward, do not slow down. Don't slow the pace for me unless I tell you. And then she went and came to the man of God to Mount Carmel, Har Carmel. Har Carmel is in this modern city of Haifa. And of course we know that that is where Elijah, his predecessor, who had the same spirit, defeated the priests of Baal during the days of Ahab and Jezebel. And it came about when the man of God saw her at a distance that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is the Shunammit. Please run out to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is troubled within her. And the Lord has hidden it from me, and has not told me. Now look what she says. It is well. She answered, it is well. Just like that wonderful hymn by that wonderful man whose family was killed at sea, and he came to Jerusalem. And what is today the American Colony Hotel, you can go to the very room where he composed the hymn, It is well with my soul. No matter what the circumstances of life, even the most unthinkable tragedies, bereavement of a child, it is still well with our soul. She had that kind of faith. Okay. But let's continue. She's troubled, and the Lord has hidden it from me and not told me, and she said, did I not ask for his son from my Lord? I did not say, do not deceive me, didn't I? And then he said to Gehazi, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand, and go your way. If you meet any man, do not salute him. If anyone salutes you, do not answer him, and lay my staff on the lad's face. And the mother of the lad said, as the Lord lives and as your servants yourself live, I will not leave you. And he arose and followed her. Now notice how similar this is to the Shulamit, not Shunamit, but Shulamit woman with Elijah. Very close parallel. Okay. It goes on. So he returned to meet him and told him, and the lad had not awakened. When Elijah came into the house, behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed. So he entered and shut the door after them both and prayed to the Lord. Again, what did Jesus do? Remember, he put the people out of the room? Just <laughs> And he went up and lay on the child. He put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself on him. And the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked into the house once back and forth. And he went up and stretched himself on him. And the lad sneezed seven times. And the lad opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammit. So he called her. And when she had come to him, he said, Take up your son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground. And she took up her son and went out. Incredible story, replaying both the saga of Elijah and prefiguring the saga of Jesus. Now, this place, Shunam, is walking distance. Like, by walking distance, I mean from here to the I-15, okay? Uh, to a place called Nain, Nain, 
or which comes from na'in, meaning pleasant, na'in. Remember when Jesus came and it was the funeral and the widow was grieving over her dead son and he raised her dead son of the grieving mother at na'in. Well, this is the same location. It's the same location. Okay, same location, only this is what na'in was called before it was uh, called na'in, it was called shunan. But very close, very close, a walking distance. Um, what Jesus would later do at the same place, raising the widow's son, Elisha, prefiguring Christ, does it. All of the Old Testament prophets, all of the Hebrew prophets, foreshadow Jesus, Yeshua, in some way. And Elisha, of course, is no exception by any means. We'll come back to that very, very shortly. But we're looking at the seven sneezes. The dynamics of regeneration. How does second birth work? What is the spiritual dynamics of second birth? How does being born again really work? What does it mean in terms of its essential elements? How exactly does God do it? What really happens and what doesn't? Before we look at what happens, let's understand what it is not. What the dynamics of regeneration, of second birth, are not. How it does not work. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 6, verse 44. Second birth, regeneration, it is not Pelagianism or the sanitized version of Pelagianism, which is called Phineism. It is not that. As some of you know, I am no great admirer of Augustine of Hippo, but he was right about Pelagius, the heretical monk who denied original sin. Man is fallen. He cannot choose Christ of his own initiative because of the fallen nature. Man is spiritually dead. It requires an act of divine intervention to come to faith in Christ. Now Charles Finney denied this. He was a borderline Pelagian. He denied there was original sin. He agreed everybody had sin, but he denied the fallen nature of man. King David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Man is fallen. He's born fallen, therefore he must be born again. Pelagianism is wrong and Phineism is wrong. The seminal influence that brought about cheap grace. God loves you, just put your hand up without talking about repentance and what it cost Jesus to save us. This comes seminally from Phineism. Grace is free, but it is by no means cheap. It is free, but it is not in the least bit cheap. It cost God everything when he gave his son in our place. Pelagianism is absolutely false. Look with me, please, to John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I'll raise him up on the last day. Nobody can choose Christ. Jesus said, I chose you. We cannot choose Christ of our own initiative. It requires divine intervention. Look with me, please, to John 15, verse 16. You did not cho choose me, but I chose you, okay, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, okay. Pelagianism is wrong. Nobody can choose Jesus. You can't talk somebody into it. They must be drawn by the Father through the Spirit to the Son, okay. 
Now, in response to this error, something has happened. Throughout the centuries of Christianity, the Christian church, broadly speaking, has been very good, unfortunately, at correcting error with error, or trying to correct error with error. You do not correct error with error, you can correct error with truth. The second error. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 12, verse 32. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Second error. Particularism, also known as particular redemption. Whether Calvin believed it or not, it is ascribed to him by his followers in their tulip. T-U-L, L, limited atonement. Jesus didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect. God made some people, created some for hell, and he created some for heaven. And if you are predestined to go to heaven, you're going to get saved spontaneously. Then you'll get faith. This is religious lunacy. It is not Judeo-Christian. It is Islamic. It is philosophically and theosophically Islamic. Inja Allah. Everything that happens is Allah's perfect will. It's an Islamic belief. It is not a Christian belief. Now again, Calvinistic scholars debate whether Calvin believed it or not himself, but it is popularly what we call Reformed. Now, there are or have been moderate Calvinists like Charles Spurgeon who'd say, Lord, save thy elect and please elect some more. Okay, he, he was trying to deal with it. Let's look at this false concept of regeneration. Look with me, please, to Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Now this is, of course, spoken specifically to Israel and the Jews, but they are, of course, a microcosm of the human condition. The idea of to turn... In Hebrew, repent, teshuvah, means to turn, to turn, to turn from sin towards God, or if you believed, if you're backslidden, return to God. Repentance means to turn or to return. It is not simply being apologetic or contrite about something. Repentance may involve being contrite, apologetic, regretting something, but it is a turning. If there is no turning from sin, there is no real repentance. It's just like the, the, the Catholics go to the, the confession and say three Hail Marys for their penance and go out and do the same stuff again. That's not repentance. Okay? The Greek word is metanoia. Um, Luther came to realize from a French humanist called Lefebvre that metanoia did not mean the sacrament of penance. It meant to repent, to turn. If somebody does not turn away from sin towards God, or if a backslider does not return to the Lord, if their life doesn't change, it's not a real repentance. It doesn't matter how sorry they say they are, or how much they regret it, or how apologetic they are. Repentance is turning. Contrite, being contrite is the fruit of it. 
is a ramification of it, is a symptom of it, a characteristic of it, a ramification of it, but it's not what it is. It's turning. It's actively turning. Otherwise, it's not genuine. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. No delight. Right up to the last moment, he dipped the sop and gave it to Judas. He was willing to forgive Judas. Now, does God foreknow who's going to repent and who isn't? Yes, he's God. He's in eternity. But does God desire people to perish? No, he does not create people to go to hell. Look with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Let's begin in 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all. Verses 3 and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now verse 3 of chapter 2 of 1 Timothy is Christological. It points to the deity of Christ. It points to the deity. God is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. It points to the deity of Christ. That's one of those verses we use when we talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. Verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He does not force his will. He chose us. He wants us to choose him. He desires all men to be saved. Now Calvinism, following the philosophy of 16th century humanism and following Islam says, well, if it's God's will for it to happen, it would have to happen. That would mean everybody would be saved. This is known as the heresy of universalism. Everybody will be saved. There was a heretic about five or six years ago named Rob Bell who wrote a book saying love wins and this was the lie of Satan that he propagated. No. Wrong. He's the savior of all men. Look with me please to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 10. For it is for this that we labor and strive, because we fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He's the Savior of everyone. I will draw all men unto me. Yet, the text makes a distinction between all men and especially those who believe. Scripture does this kind of thing, or this is God's nature shown in other scripture. For instance, God has no grandchildren, only children. A baby must be, grow up and come to faith in Jesus. But, 1 Corinthians 7 tells us, the Lord does draw a distinction between the child of a saved believer and other children. He makes a distinction between the child of a saved Christian parent or parents and other children. He makes that distinction. But because their parents are believers, that doesn't make them a believer. They have to accept Christ, yet the distinction is there, according to 1 Corinthians 7. Well, he's the savior of all men. Anus Dei Quitotus Picata Mundi. You've heard me say that from the Latin Vulgate. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay. Savior of all men, especially of believers. The distinction is there, but it is all encompassing. Do not believe the false teachings of Calvinism, that he only died for the elect, that he created some for heaven and some for hell. This is a lie. This is not a God of love. Now they will talk about election. What they actually teach is, first of all, they confuse the charismatic gift of faith with the saving faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We're saved by grace through faith, sola fide. Okay? We're saved by grace through faith. Anything not done in faith is sin. Do I have the faith to do this? Does the Lord use this? Anything not done in faith is sin. You know, um, 
We're saved by grace through faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And Paul writes, you all have a measure of faith. That is a faith. Okay? You can't be saved without it. But then there's a charismatic gift of faith that goes beyond that that some people have and some don't. Okay? There's people who have a charismatic gift of faith. God reveals something to them, often something in the future, and they can trust and believe God and pray it's going to happen. You know, they know if they persist in their prayer, God is going to bring this about, okay? It goes beyond the faith we all have. There are some people have a gift of faith. Very often people given to intercessory prayer will have the gift of faith. They will have the gift of faith. They'll know, they'll know they're going to get it or God's going to do it. Now, some people have that gift, some don't. Or the, the gift operates through some people. The, the gift is, of course, through the body, not to an individual, but it's through an individual. Well, Calvinists confuse that charismatic gift of faith with faith in the broad sense. Peace days. Now, in both Greek and Hebrew, the word for faith and faithfulness is the same. In Greek, peace days. In Hebrew, emunah. We get the word amen. It is faithful. Okay. We're saved by grace through faith. We're saved by grace through faithfulness. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faithfulness. This further throws Calvinistic beliefs of unconditional, once saved, always saved, out the window. If your faith is real, you're going to be faithful. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. That's faith. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. What Calvinism does, it draws a distinction between faith and faithfulness. Well, neither the Greek language nor the Hebrew language do. The English language does. Uh, Calvin's French did. But the scriptures don't make that distinction. Faith equals faithfulness. If somebody has a real faith, they're going to be faithful. Okay? We're saved by faith. We're saved by faithfulness. Of course, that's predicated upon the faithfulness of Christ. He remains faithful when we are unfaithful, but that is it. Okay? So, what Calvinism says is, oh no, if you're predestined, God will make you born again. Then you'll get faith. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to have faith to get born again. <laughs> Well, how can you have faith if you're spiritually dead? We will come to that. They don't understand the dynamics of regeneration. Remember, Calvinism is 16th, I've said this before, it is 16th century philosophy masquerading as first century Judeo-Christian theology. It is something that is Islamic. It is not Judeo-Christian. There's a reason the Mullahs in Iran like the Puritans. There's a couple of reasons. They do. They, they have the, the, the Mutawa, the religious police in Saudi Arabia, and things like this. The Taliban had this. The, the morals, well, that, Calvin did that in Geneva. Um, the Puritans did that in, in, in England. Um, and in Salem, Massachusetts. It's Islamic. Calvinism, the more Calvinistic something or someone is, the closer it is to Islam. The closer it is to Islam theologically and philosophically. But not our subject now. I only mention it in passing relative to what is our subject now. The idea that God makes somebody born again and then they get faith, this is nonsense. Well, what about election? Well, what about election? Look with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. One of the places they get it. Verses 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him, electos, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He's predestined us to adoption as sons. You see this predestination. He made some for heaven, some for hell. That's what they say. 
That's what they say. Just as he chose us. Election in the Bible, in this sense, is always plural. Israel is and remains an elect nation. But individual Jews who reject their own Messiah are not saved. Unless they repent and accept their Messiah, Yeshua, they have no salvation. Many will come from the east and west and recline with Abraham and the fathers, but you will be put to outermost darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because somebody is a Jew, that doesn't mean they're going to be saved. But the nation corporately remains elect. Salvation comes from the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. God has a prophetic destiny for Israel and the Jews. It remains. It's corporate. So it is with the body of Christ. I am not elect. You are not elect. We are elect. We are elect. Now for a Jew who's a member of an elect nation to have salvation, he must accept the Messiah. Or she must accept the Messiah. Well, the body of Christ is elect. We're elect, but you have to be a follower of Jesus. Or you're not one of us. It's as Jesus said in Revelation, Jews who say they are Jews but are not. They were rejecting the Messiah and persecuting Jews who did believe. Those who say they are Jews but are not. Just because you're physically, anthropologically, genetically a Jew, <laughs> what... Well, okay, there's an advantage culturally and to them belong the oracles of God. All of that is true, providing you believe. If you don't believe, you may as well be an Eskimo. Not that there's anything wrong with Eskimos. There's Eskimos who believe. And there's unfortunately Jews who don't. The Eskimos will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The rabbis who reject their own Messiah won't be unless they repent and believe in him, but let's move on. Election is corporate. Election is corporate. Now let's really be careful about this. Look with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. who has saved us and called us, not according to our works, our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. God has chose us to do a specific thing. From before the universe existed, God has called us to do something. God called Marco to be a pastor. God called me to be a Bible expositor. God may have called you to be an evangelist or a missionary or whatever. Your calling is predestined. <laughs> Your salvation, our salvation, is foreknown. The calling is predestined. Whatever ministry God calls you to, God ordained for you to do that before the universe as we know it existed. That's an Incredible thing, but it's an incredible truth. But let's continue looking at this. What else is not real regeneration? Look with me, please, to John chapter 6. Well, let's begin, sorry, Romans chapter 6. Let's look at Romans 6 first. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? You get baptized because you have died with Christ and become a new creation. You bury the corpse, co-resurrect with Christ. You get baptized because you've been saved, not in order to be saved. Who is going to put 
a baby, grab it out of a crib, and put it into a coffin if it's not dead. It's absurd. You only bury a corpse. If somebody has not become a new creation, if the old man, the old woman has not died with Christ by faith, you can't bury it. You baptize because somebody has been regenerated. Not in order to make them regenerated. This is sacramentalism. There are different forms of sacramentalism. We will look perhaps at two of them. Sacramental soteriology, sacramental salvation, sacramentalism. One major one is baptismal. Another major one is Eucharistic. The theological term is Latin ex opere operato. There is some saving power in the ritual itself. That if you sprinkle a baby, you can make it a Christian. This is ridiculous. You can't sprinkle a baby and make it a Christian any more than you can sprinkle an elephant and make it a Christian. It's an absurdity. This is sacramentalism. That's baptismal regeneration. It is not scriptural. If somebody was baptized as a baby... And then they got born again later in life. Don't count that sprinkling or whatever it was when you were a baby as baptism. You need to get baptized as a believer. You can only bury the dead. Let's look. Turn with me to John 6. Again, most of you are aware of these things. Same chapter where it says, no one can believe, come to me lest the Father draws him. Verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe. Okay. That you believe. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall not thirst. Okay. Belief. Okay. But now you get to verse 47. I say to you, he who believes in me. Believe what? The gospel, the word of God. Jesus is the word, incarnate, isn't he? And the Bible is Jesus in print. You believe the word, you eat it. Look with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 3 if you don't know. Verse 1, son of man, eat what you find. Take the scroll and eat it. Believe the word of God in such a way as you will act on it. Hearing it is not good enough. You've got to eat it. You've got to take it into yourself. Metabolically, what we eat we are, the Greek word broma. Organically, it becomes part of us, doesn't it? You eat watermelons, it organically becomes part of you. Okay? <laughs> you eat a banana, organically the potassium is, is, is absorbed into your metabolism. What you eat, you are. As you can see, I'm mostly lasagna and haagen <laughs> Well, spiritually, it's... What are you laughing at? Yo soy el muchacho gordo. Yo tengo un problema. <laughs> Spiritually, it's the same. What you eat, you are. Eat the scroll. Look at Jeremiah. Yermiyahu Hanavi. J 
Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Thy words were found and I ate them. Thy words became for me a joy of delight. I have been called by thy name, therefore I did not sit in the circle of the merrymakers. Those in the religious freak show. He ate the word. He knew what was really happening. He wasn't deluded by the merrymaking. He didn't go to Toronto or Pensacola. Look at John chapter 10, please. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 10, my apologies. Verse 10, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. Sweet in my mouth, bitter in his gut. Eating the word is believing it. Not licking it. Eating it. What does it say in Hebrews? You've become partakers. You've taken it into yourself. You've eaten. Okay. Eating the word. Jesus is the word according to John. The word that was made flesh. So... John says again, again, and again in the same passage, belief is the key to eternal life. But then you take a text out of context and isolation from the co-text. Verse 51, I'm the living bread. Whoever eats this shall live forever. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, in verse 53, and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. That's Catholicism. That's Roman Catholicism. That's High Anglicanism. To a degree, that's catechetical Lutheranism. It's Eastern Orthodoxy, but it's not Scripture. Eating is believing. The Lord's Supper, as we'll see, Zota su le zikroni. A Paschal Seder, do this in remembrance of me. More about that later. Let's look. See, you have to eat the word. Yeah. What, what that means in the context is believe. Text, context, co-text. When you take it out of context, what do you have? Stop reading right there. Don't read verse 63. Don't continue reading. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. <laughs> if the Eucharist is the protoplasmic flesh of Christ, which is nonsense anyway, it's based on Aristotle's theory of accidents. Thomas Aquinas he find it in its present form in, 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 the, middle, in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Wait a minute. The flesh profits nothing. Jesus said the bread I'm going to give is, is going to last forever. Your fathers ate this other bread in the wilderness, which is a type of Christ coming down. Okay, fair enough. But, but they died. The bread I'm going to give is going to live... <laughs> I guarantee that your Roman Catholic Eucharist, Jesus, is going to wind up in the Los Angeles sewage system three hours from now. I guarantee your blood of your Eucharistic Jesus Christ is going to wind up in a urinal an hour from now. It's the spiritual that doesn't perish. Take the text out of context. In isolation from the co-text. What did the apostles say about cannibalism in Acts 15? Don't drink blood. It's vampire religion. It's demonic. It's pagan. Don't do that. Don't drink the blood. The devil's very unhappy that I pointed that out. Drink the root beer. Don't drink the blood. That's the way it goes. So, what is Eucharistic salvation? 
It's sacramentalism, isn't it? It's a sacrament, Sacramento, capital of California. <laughs> the corrupt politicians all keep raising your taxes so you're forced to move to Texas. <laughs> Sacramentalism. That is not regeneration. That is not second birth. That is not how it happens. Look with me, please, to Romans chapter 6. Baptized into Jesus have been baptized into his death. Okay. He does it. By the works of the law, no man shall be saved. Remember, you've heard me say it 10,000 times. Saved Christians do good works because they have been saved, not in order to get saved. Faith without works is dead. We were saved to do good works, in part. That's true also. But the works can't save us. All of our righteous deeds are as a polluted garment. Does anybody need me to explain what that means? If you don't know what I'm talking about, put your hand up. I'll tell you when you get older. Does everybody know what that means? All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Does everybody know what it means? Yes. You all know what it means? Yes. Okay. Huh? Scuba, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's no works based salvation. The idea, yeah, Jesus died for our sins, but we have to do this and this and this to get saved. No, 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 no. This is synergism. Workspace salvation. None of that is the true gospel. None of that is what happens with second birth. None of that is what transpires with regeneration. None of it. These are all false gospels. All of them, to some degree. Now, I'm not saying that there may not be sincere Christians who are taken in by some of this. I know people who are Calvinistic Christians who I do believe are born again and are really saved. I know others who <laughs> almost certainly are not, but I do know ones who are. Okay. Nonetheless, none of that is what happens with second birth. None of it. What does happen with second birth? We're going to look, first of all, at two Greek terms. Zoo, as in zoo, we get to life. Paul Eo. Zuo poio. Zuo poio is actually a clinical term which means resuscitate 
or reinvigorate. It means to resuscitate something that was dead. To reinvigorate something that was dead. In a surgical theater, if there's no alpha brainwave activity after five minutes, they can legally declare the patient dead and stop trying. But if they can resuscitate them, electrocardial shock, whatever they need to do, you keep trying. That's it. You put a measure of life back into that which was dead. Now, we can only approximate that clinically. God can actually do it. He can take somebody that was dead and put the life into them like he did with the Shunammite's son. God can invigorate, reinvigorate a corpse. Okay. Okay. The other term, is we get the word eclectic. Eclectic. This word is very interesting indeed. This word means this is a medical term, this is a legal term. Convict. Convict. You have one medical term, one clinical term, one legal term. Okay. The late heretic, John Wimber, from Orange County, was soft on sin. He was into the seeker-friendly <laughs> compromised gospel, if you want to call it the gospel. And Wimber, John Wimber, said, we are taking the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and putting it into the family drawing room. Instead of having God as judge, we're going to have him as a loving father. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all put the gospel into the language of the courtroom. Jesus was put on trial for what we did. He was innocent of what they accused him of, but we were guilty of it. The just for the unjust. Unless you understand God as a righteous judge who hates and will judge sin, you cannot understand him as a loving father. But this was the lies of the Vineyard Movement and of the late John Wimber, who promoted much error, including the ecumenical deception. No. It is a legal term. When somebody is born again, those two things happen. They are resuscitated and they then are convicted. A corpse cannot respond to anything. A cadaver cannot respond to anything. People are spiritually dead. You can think of an unsaved person as a non-believer, as a cadaver on artificial cardiopulmonary support system. They're breathing, they seem to be metabolizing to a degree, but they're brain dead. Well, unsaved people are spiritually dead. They are dead. They cannot communicate with God. It's impossible. We can witness to an unsaved person till we are blue in the face. 
Unless the Father draws them and they are convicted by the Holy Spirit, they're not going to get saved and they will never be convicted by the Holy Spirit unless they are reinvigorated. Okay. Now let's understand what happens here. So to put his staff on him. The staff, of course, unlike this one is metallic, that one was wood. In Hebrew, the word for tree is the word for wood, etz. Tree of life, etz haim. Cursed is everyone who hangs on on etz, on a tree. Anything made from a tree is called tree. A pencil. There's a word eparon, but you can say etz. Tree. You got a pencil? You got a you got a tree? <laughs> Everything made from wood, whatever it is, is called tree. It's called wood. Same word in Hebrew. Okay? Yeah. Doesn't work. Okay. Well, let's look at this. Because says everyone hangs on a tree. He takes this and puts it on top of the corpse, right? He puts the wood, the tree, on top of the corpse. Then he lays on top of him, spread out, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand. He's like this. Laying on top of him. When this happens, the kid is resuscitated and sneezes seven times. God's number of perfection. At you, at you, at you, at you. Here, here. At you, at you. Seven times. Seven times. Why? Look with me, please, if you will, to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Man was only the highest form of biological life. They, what Darwinists say we are. We were simply a, an ape with better DNA. But we went from being two-dimensional beings to three-dimensional beings. God put a spirit in us. What happened? He breathed into his nostrils, his holy breath, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Notice the nostrils. That is what happens in birth. That is what happens in second birth. Look with me, please, to John chapter 20. Jesus raises from the dead. Verse 22. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what happens in birth. That's what happens in second birth. Man dies because of sin. He has to be reinvigorated. But the nostrils are congested. The dust particles, the mucus. <laughs> You've got to clear the nostrils. What do you do if you try to resuscitate someone medically? Clear the air passages. Certainly. But he breathed into the nostrils. That's the filtration system. The nostrils are designed to filter out contagions, particle emissions, dust, pollen, the nose. Breathes into the nose. He sneezes seven times. When you witness to somebody and they begin to respond, they are sneezing. You understand? God is removing the obstruction. 
He has reinvigorated them. He has put a measure of life back into that corpse. Eyeball to eyeball, they begin to see. They begin to hear. Just like a baby. It comes progressively. When an unsaved person is under the conviction of sin, they are beginning to sneeze. Once God has gotten rid of the gook, he breathes on them. And they're regenerated. They are born of the Spirit. You understand? What you have is reinvigoration and conviction. They are convicted of their sin. A corpse can't be convicted of its guilt. Have to be alive. What God does is put a measure of life back into a corpse. If he has not put that measure of life, if zoopeo had not happened, that person cannot hear the gospel or respond to Christ. He must put a measure of life. But then they have to sneeze. They must choose Christ. They couldn't choose if God didn't reinvigorate them. The will of fallen man is not free. They're spiritually dead. God makes it possible for them to choose. At that point, they must. One of the many errors of Calvinism is that it denies the restoration of free will. Man lost his free will through sin, absolutely. But they deny the restoration of it at the cross and in the resurrection. Now, how does this happen? It's interesting how it happens. This conviction happens working through the conscience. The paradokin, the para... Well... People are given over. Paradokin, they're given over to wickedness. If they reject the gospel, they're given over to it. We see this in first in Romans chapter 1, verse 26, with people persisting in homosexuality. They're given over to it. Okay. However, however, there is another word, teko teres menon. Teko teres menon. Okay. It works to their conscience. If somebody's conscience is seared, it becomes dysfunctional. There are people who are given over and their conscience becomes seared. It's dysfunctional. They cannot be convicted anymore. God is no longer convicting them of sin. Kakoteris menon. The conscience is seared. Burub, burub, is seared. So the conscience is then seared, burub. They become given over. An unsaved person under the conviction of sin, it's a thing of the conscience. They become convicted of their sin. If there's no conviction of sin, there's not going to be any real repentance. If there's not a real repentance, there's not going to be a real regeneration. Okay? You all know the story of the channel swimmer, right? I've told you that. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? You don't know the channel swimmer. Okay, no problem. Very briefly. I live in England most of the time. And he got about 21 miles from Calais, France, to the White Cliffs of Dover in England. And every year they have these people who swim the English Channel. They literally swim it. But if a gale force comes, and the waves become tumultuous, and it begins to rain, and there's a thunderstorm, they're in trouble. There's boats that rescue them, but they're there. So there's a Channel swimmer. 
and the sky becomes dark and cloudy. They can't see. They become disoriented. They don't know which direction they're heading. They can't see the white cliffs of Dover in front of them or to the left or to the right or on back. They don't know where they are. They just know they're going into neuromuscular exhaustion in the cold salt water. They're going to drown. They're going to die. They will never make it. In desperation, they call out to God. Please save me! Please save me! A helicopter comes down from the clouds. Says Jesus on it. This Jewish guy puts his head out. And he says, you called me. Yes, Jesus, please save me. You realize you can't save yourself. I have to do it for you. You have to do what I tell you. You're doomed. You're dead. You're finished. You have to trust me and do what I tell you. Only I can save you. You understand that? Yes, Jesus, I understand that. I'll do what you say. Put this on. Throws him a life jacket. These are called the garments of salvation by Isaiah. He's covered me with the garments of salvation. He's clothed me with the robe of righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. Put it on! on. What do I do now, Jesus? Keep swimming. You must act on what you have received. You don't do the good works to get saved. You do it because you've been saved. Amen. Now, you couldn't do it in your own strength. He had to give you the life jacket. Yes. Now, if you're stupid enough to take that jacket off and backslide, I hope you're a real good swimmer. Nobody's made it yet. <laughs> that is the way it works. Everybody understand? Yes. Amen. Now, there's one other thing. The conscience is there, but there is the case of the believer. This does not happen to a believer. Do believers sin? Yes, they just don't practice it. When a believer sins, there's no eclectic. We're not convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit when we sin. That is a legal term. The unsaved are convicted. Christ atoned for our sin. We're not convicted. Something else happens to a believer. What happens is lupiti. Lupiti. Grieve. The Holy Spirit is in us, and we have grieved him. The way the Lord prompts a saved Christian to repent of having dropped their cross, failed in their walk. The way the Lord deals with a believer is different. Christ was convicted, and we were convicted of sin, but Christ became the convict. That is a legal term. With us, it's something different. We have grieved his spirit. Sin, you think of Jesus, covered with blood, tortured by the Romans, rejected by his father, laying there, being nailed to a cross. Remember, he didn't die for all of us simply. He died for each of us. He went through it just for me personally, just for you personally. If nobody else existed but you or I, he would have done it just for us personally. Did he die for all of us? Yes, but he died for each of us. You said you look at him. What am I using your blood like a credit card? Just charge it to him? This is licentiousness. You can call it the hyper grace lie of Joseph Prince in Singapore, among others. He's a false teacher. No, no. Jesus' blood is not a credit card with no limit that he pays the bill for. You can spurn that blood if you don't repent. 
We don't get convicted. We grieve. We grieve. He loved me so much, he went to the cross for me, and I've done this to him again. Amen. We grieve. The Holy Spirit in us is grieved. His spirit is in our spirit. It is a thing of grief. Our regret is grief. We grieve over our sin. Unsaved people, they are convicted. We grieve. They practice sin. We fall into it. Unfortunately. Don't have to, but we do. So it is. They don't have a choice. They're, they're not born again. They're under the law. And so in real regeneration, God reinvigorates the corpse. He puts a measure of life into someone who's dead. Then he clears the nasal passages. All the junk they believed, the Darwinism, the Catholicism, the New Age, the whatever, the lies of the world. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. <laughs> whatever they're trusting in is preventing God's spirit from going into them. You believe in a false religion? The nasal passages are congested. The oral buccal cavity is incapable of respiration. Believe in some secular philosophy, some humanism, some... The passages are congested. You gotta sneeze and keep sneezing until all the gook is gone. And then he lays on top. <laughs> He takes, puts it on, dead, eye to eye, hand to hand, mouth to mouth, and he breathes the new life into us. That is what happens when somebody is truly born again. That is the real dynamic of regeneration. All that other stuff is religion and philosophy. This is the gospel. Thank you so much for listening. We're coming to the end of Passover week what Jewish people call Hag Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Matzah, no leaven. Striped and pierced. He's pierced for our transgressions, by his stripes we are healed. Look with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When Jewish families celebrate the Passover, it's preceded by the Bedichat Chametz, the search for leaven. Everything containing leaven, yeast, is removed from the house. Leaven contributes nothing to the nutritional value of the bread, it only pumps up. Leaven in scripture is a figure of sin, particularly the seminal sin of pride. It is also a figure of false doctrine. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. When people teach false doctrine or preach false doctrine, they're being driven by spiritual pride. Pride is the sin that gives rise to other sin. Satan's first sin in eternity, according to Isaiah, was pride. Man's first sin in the garden was pride. You can be like God. Pride is the sin that gives rise to other sin. 
unrighteous anger, lust, greed, you name it, underneath it is pride. None of us, of course, have anything to be proud of except Jesus. We can be proud of him. As far as ourselves, <laughs> what do we have to be proud of? Nothing. 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 And so before we come to the Lord's table, we purge the leaven. First Corinthians 5, clean out the old leaven. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the entire lump? Only takes a little. Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ the Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now he says, I have written you not to associate with the moral people. I didn't mean with the moral people of the world, the unsaved or the covetousness, or the swindlers. In other words, the word faith prosperity preachers. Or with the people of the world, idolaters. Then you'd have to go out of the world. No, we're to be in the world, but not of it. Cloisterism is not a Christian doctrine. What the Amish have tried to do, look what became to them. They were Mennonites, their ancestors were believers, but they went into this closed community and tried to live the way people did in the 17th century with no electricity and things like that. And they think that's going to make them holy. It doesn't. Most of them are not even saved. And the ones who are saved <laughs> tend to be ostracized and shunned by the rest of the community, including their own family. We're in the world, not of it. How are you going to witness to unsaved people if you're not in contact with them. No, he's saying about any so-called brother. First Corinthians chapter 11 tells us when we come to the Lord's table, which is our Passover, verse 27, whoever eats or the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man or woman examine themselves, so let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And he goes on, verse 30, for this reason many of you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Defiling the Lord's table, coming to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin can result in physical illness. It can result in even premature giving up the ghost. Now, we're not saying they're going to go to hell because it says sleep, not death. But you can actually reduce your longevity if you habitually take the Lord's Supper with unconfessed sin. We need to put things right with him and to the extent possible with each other should that occasion arise. The Lord's Supper is a way that God uses to keep us in repentance mode. We recount our sins, our shortcomings, our failures, and we confess those things before we come to his table. The Bedichat Chametz, the search of all leaven, the Lord's Passover. So before we go any further, let us purge the leaven. Let's come before the Lord and confess our sin, for he is righteous and just to forgive. Father, we thank you for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin. Empower us, Lord God, to be what we cannot be, to do what we cannot do, and desire what we cannot desire. Let the old nature be crucified, and let the new nature work with Christ and walk with Christ. Purge the leaven, Lord, if there be leaven in us, remove it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
The Lord's Supper is for baptized believers. If you are a believer, if you've not been baptized, you need to be. If you have a child who is born again, they are welcome. But if they are not born again, wait. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, Exodus 13, when your child sees you eating the Passover and they ask why you do it, it's because of what God did when he took us out of Egypt. When your children see you taking the Lord's Supper, why do you do it? It's an object lesson because of what Jesus did when he saved me out of the world. Do you want him to save you out of the world? It is a way to teach our children about their need for salvation. It's not for children who are not born again yet. It's not for people who are not baptized Christians. This is the Lord's Supper. Now there's something else. Passover Jews, of course, as you know, look back and look forward. They look back to the redemption out of Egypt with Moses. But they look forward to the coming of the Messiah when they eat the Passover. They say, Shana Haba Yerushalayim next year in Jerusalem at the end of the Seder meal. So we look back and we look forward. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is a memorial of his crucifixion and his resurrection. It is a foretaste, an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the way that God has ordained, instituted, for us to spiritually and emotionally cope with the, sep the temporary separation of giving up the ghost from a loved one. When we take the Lord's Supper now. No matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to you, I might snuff it, you might snuff it. The same as we eat the Lord's Supper now and drink the cup now, we're going to do it again at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Nothing can separate you from me or me from you because nothing can separate us from Jesus. Only at the marriage supper of the Lamb it'll be Jesus leading the Seder, not Jacob Prash. I'm an invited guest. I'll probably have a seat in the back. That'll be it. It is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb, a memorial of what he did do, a foretaste of what he's going to do. Remember, it is a memorial if you're from a Catholic background. It's not the same sacrifice as Calvary. He does not die again and again and again. Hebrews tells us that is false. This is the truth. He dies once and for all. It is a memorial. But it is a testimony of what he's going to do. You have an unsaved loved one who's a saved believer, husband, wife, parent, whatever, and they're terminally ill and the Lord's not going to heal them, take the Lord's Supper with them. Call the pastor, call the chaplain of the hospital, take the Lord's Supper. Same as we do this now. We're going to do it again. Don't worry, nothing can separate us from each other. Jesus has conquered death. We're going to take the Lord's Supper again at the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the way God ordained for us to teach our children. This is the way God ordained for us to stay in repentance mode. This is the way God ordained for us to cope spiritually and emotionally with any te temporal, temporary separations that may befall us biologically. This is the way. And so we come to his table. Can we distribute the elements, please? Don't eat it yet until we we'll do it all together. First the bread, please, and then we'll do the wine. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed and broke it, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What he would have said was, Zegufi shenehashpar badchem zotasu lezikroni. Barukata odenai Eloheinu melech ha'olam motzi elechem in haaretz. Amen. The body of Yeshua, Jesus, that was broken for us.
And in the same manner after supper, he also took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Hakosazot hi abrita hadasha. Zedami shinashpach bodchem. Zotasu lezikroni. Baruch ata odenai. Eloheinu melech haolam. Borei pri hagefen. Amen. The blood of Jesus, Yeshua, that was poured out for our sin. And so we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he is coming soon. <laughs>